Hello everyone, welcome again to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Um, in this, this is the first video that deviates from the traditional way of teaching probability and statistics. So I thought that I would give you like a brief explanation. Um, usually in course on probability and statistics, first you get all the information about probability theory that you so that you know all the mathematical tools and concepts very well. And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, okay, so now what I do, what do I do with all of this? If I have like a data set, because you know I want to do some data science. So then that's where statistical tools are introduced to actually manipulate the data and estimate um, these probabilistic, um, probabilistic concepts that have been previously defined. Uh, in my experience, this makes it a bit complicated um, to provide uh, good intuition about the probabilistic tools because you have to wait a long time until you see how you actually uh, use them when uh, you're manipulating data. And because of that, I'm going to try to introduce uh, statistical techniques based on the probabilistic tools as soon as possible so that we can get our, our hands dirty uh, very early on and understand the potential and limitations of these probabilistic um, uh, probabilistic tools that we're learning about when we're actually dealing with data. Okay, so yeah, that, that, that's my spiel. Uh, I hope this, this makes sense to you. Uh, so let's get started. We want to um, understand how to estimate probabilities from data. Okay, that's the whole goal of this video. Um, up to now, we have introduced important concepts in probability theory, probability spaces, conditional probability, uh, but we don't know what to do if, if we get some data. Okay, so we're going to try to remedy that to some extent. Uh, and for that, we're going to basically have to um, figure out how to estimate probabilities from data. The prerequisites for this material are probability and conditional probability. You have to be familiar uh, with this definition, the definitions of these concepts and their properties in order to actually uh, know what we are estimating. Okay, so let's go back to our intuitive definition of probability, of the probability of an event. Our intuitive definition was, okay, we're going to imagine that this um, uncertain phenomenon of interest is an experiment, it can, repeat it, it can be repeated many, many, many times. We're just going to compute the fraction of times that uh, the event occurs uh, of all the times that the experiment is repeated. Okay. Um, so we're going to build upon that intuitive definition to define an estimator, a statistical estimator of the probability of an event. Okay, so imagine that you have a sample space uh, omega that is modeling some uncertain phenomenon of interest, and you have defined an event A. And now you see some data. Okay, these data have values in omega. For example, let's think of the die roll. We're rolling a die. Get okay. two, three, five, six, two, one, and so on. Okay, we roll it n times. And now we're interested in, well, we want to estimate the probability of an event. For example, the probability that the die roll is equal to three. That's an event, right? So if, I, if you didn't know anything, you know, about everything that we've done before. And sometimes actually it's useful to think, okay, what if I applied common sense? Like, let me forget about all the math. Let me just apply common sense. What is the probability of a three if I've rolled a hundred times and I've seen uh, 10 threes? Well, you would say 10 divided by 100, right? And this connects with our intuitive definition of what we think a probability should mean. And that, at the end of the day, is the empirical probability. And as you will see, we're going to use empirical probability all over the place to estimate uh, probabilistic um, objects from data. Okay, so put a bit more formally, we have this set of data X, uh, where this is why I have like this subscript there, like it's a conditional, it's it's a probability measure, uh, but um, it, it, it's a function of X also. So that, that's how I indicate it. The probability of, the empirical probability of A is, um, we basically sum from i um, from i equal to one to i equal to n, and this is an indicator variable that is equal to one if that data point is in a. Okay, so this is just a fancy way of writing the number of times that the number of data, sorry, that are in a. Okay, and like in the case of this die roll that I just explained, it would be how many times was a die roll equal to three divided by the total number of rolls that we observe. Okay. So super intuitive according to our intuitive definition of probability. 
let's take a look at an example with a six-sided die. Um, oh, and in fact, it's a six-sided die. So this, there's a bit of a story here. Uh, it's a toy that my daughter has. And, you know, to create some data for this example, I, we just um, rolled it together 60 times. And then uh, I counted the outcomes. And you will see that the results were a little bit surprising. And we're going to get back to that later on in the course because now I have a suspicion about this die. And we will test this suspicion under the framework of hypothesis testing. But that will be later on. I actually wanted to have the die here, but I don't know where it is. The, the house is a disaster as usual. As usual. So, uh, but I will show you the die eventually. Anyways, so we have a six-sided die. Okay, the outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, six, as usual. Uh, the collection of possible events is every possible union or intersection of these guys. So it's just the power set. And now we want to estimate the probability measure. And we realized that to estimate the probability measure, we just needed to divide the um, sample space. Um, in, into the events rolling a 1, rolling a 2, rolling a 3, and so on, and assign probability to those, because then we could just compute the probability of any other event of interest within the power set in that way, right? So we wanted to come up with these numbers that added up to 1 and were non-negative. Okay, this is from the lecture on, on probability. Okay, so now, you know, I rolled the die 60 times with my daughter, and these were the actual numbers that, I mean, I recorded this very rigorously, and we got, you know, 10 ones, 12 twos, only two threes, which makes me think that there's something wrong with that die. And that's this is what we're going to come back to when we talk about hypothesis testing. Uh, but anyways, for now, uh, 13 fours, 13 fives, 10 sixes, okay? These were the, pro the, um, the actual counts that we observed. So now we apply uh, empirical probability to estimate the probability measure, we just divide all of these numbers by the total number of rolls. And because all of these guys add up to the total number of rolls, we do get a valid probability measure. All the numbers are non-negative. They add up to one. Okay. Uh, so that's empirical probability. This is actually very simple and it's used all over the place. Um, a qu an important question is, do we expect the probabilities to be true? Okay, so now let's imagine an idealized experiment where we have a fair die, which has a probability one half of being heads, one half of being um, tails. If I flip it 20 times, do I expect that the empirical probability is going to be perfect, a perfect estimate of the true probability? We know that the true probability is one half. Again, as usual, pause, think about it, and then come back. The answer is no. Right, because you can be unlucky and it, it might not happen. So to, to illustrate that, I actually uh, simulated this, this time on my computer. I didn't flip a coin 20 times. All of these times, I don't have that much time. Um, so I simulated 20 coin flips 10 times. Okay, this is the first time, 15 heads, second time, 13 heads, third time, 10 heads, and so on and so forth. So out of these guys, when did we get a perfect estimate for the empirical probability? Look at them carefully. The answer is just once, okay? Just that single time, we did get one half. Um, otherwise, the other estimates for the uh, the probability are all wrong. The question is, um, as, as everything in life, right? Like, uh, they're not exact, but they're, they should be qu kind of close to the true probability when we roll, uh, sorry, when we flip the coin many, many, many times. And we're going to talk a lot more about this. But I just wanted to make it clear here that life is not a homework problem, okay? These probabilities are not going to be true uh, because of the fact that we always have limited data to estimate these probabilities from. And here in this particular case, actually imagine that I had decided to flip once more, 21, then you cannot have an exact estimate, right? Because in order to get an exact estimate, I would have to roll 10 and a half, um, sorry, roll, flip 10 and a half heads, and that is going to be a bit complicated. Okay, so in general, it's very important to bear in mind that these empirical probabilities that we estimate from data are never going to uh, reflect a true underlying probability, but they might approach it. And again, we're going to talk uh, much more about that later on. Okay, so now let's go on to uh, conditional probabilities. So our intuitive definition for conditional probability was that if we're interested in the probability of an event B conditioned on an event A happening, uh, and we have this experiment that is repeated over and over and over and over, what we do is we just preserve the times that A occurs, and out of those, 
we see how many times did B occur. So in order to compute the, con the empirical conditional probability of an event given another event, okay, so let's say that we have A and B in a certain sample space omega, and we have a set of data. Now we want to compute the empirical conditional probability of B given A. We're going to just apply the same intuition. What we're going to say is, okay, let me take a look at this data set. How many of these guys are in A? That's the number I'm going to divide by. Okay, that's the number I'm going to divide by. Those are the, the number of guys in A. Out of those, how many are also in B? So in other words, how many of them are in the intersection between A and B? And that's it. The count of the intersection divided by the count of the event that we're conditioning on, that's the empirical conditional probability of B given A. Again, also very simple. Okay, so look, like I've just realized, because I change notation sometimes to try to make things easier, that, um, oh, I was going to say that this is a typo because, eh, okay, this is a long story, but I was changing S to A back and forth for the last couple of years. It's not a typo, right? Because here what I've done is I've said that this is one if Xi is equal to S, where S can be A or B. Okay, so this was not a typo. I was going to ask you to forgive me and let's move on because I don't want to re-record. Eh, but anyways, let's move on. So that was empirical conditional probability. Now let's actually take a look at some real data. And here I'm looking at a data set which contains the votes of the House of Representatives of the US. Uh, so the congressmen, basically, they were voting on, on two issues. Uh, one was duty free exports. Not too sure what the issue was about. 1984 was actually the, the year I was born. So I don't know what was going on in the US at that time. and I haven't had the time to, to look into it. And the other one was the budget. They're always voting on the budget. So I guess that's not uh, very surprising. And here we see the number of representatives that voted yes and yes, no and yes, yes and no, no and no. Okay, we have those numbers. We're going to transform them into probabilities. In order to do that, uh, well, no, sorry. First, what's the goal of doing this? We want to understand the um, relationship between the two issues. And the way we formulate this is if a representative votes yes on this issue, are they more likely um, to vote yes on this other issue. Okay, that's a reasonable way of uh, seeing whether the issues are connected. Um, of course, you don't need to, you don't need probability uh, to, to answer that question. You can just talk in terms of fractions and everything we're going to do. You can basically just say, oh, the fraction of representative that did this was that. It's just very intuitive to put this into a probabilistic framework and um, it actually enables you, not, not for this case maybe in particular, but it enables you to just apply like uh, sophisticated reasoning uh, in a very simple way. Okay, that's kind of the, the motivation to, to um, model this probabilistically, because at the end of the day, there's not much probabilistic about it, right? Like the, these people voted in a particular way, and we're just looking at the fraction of votes and so on. Anyways, to interpret this probabilistically, we're going to uh, interpret voting as a repeatable experiment where... Um, you know, like each repetition of the experiment is a representative voting. So the outcomes are, um, okay, we're going to build a probability space out of this. So what are the outcomes if each outcome is the votes of a representative? Well, the possible outcomes are um, yes, 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 no, no, yes, and no, no. Okay. Of course, I mean, you would say like this sounds a bit strange, like there's a certain number of representatives and so on. But again, like uh, we're, um, we have this abstraction where we want to say, you know, like we want to act as if this is an experiment that gets repeated and we talk about the probability of the experiment because this allows us to analyze the voting behavior very succinctly. Okay, so the events of interest are B, yes on budget, and D, yes on duty free. Okay. So now we, we need to estimate this thing. Okay, so the probability of B, we have to count how many votes were yes for B, which would be, let me get this right, 151 plus 88. And we're going to divide it by the total number of votes. Okay, that's the empirical probability of this event B. Okay, the sum of this and this is hopefully 239. The sum of all of them is uh, 400. Okay, so the empirical probability of uh, B is 0 0.598. We do this, the same for D. 
And again, I encourage you to try to do this on your own. You know, pause the video, try to do it quickly on your own and see if we get the same answer. Um, the votes that were yes for D are these guys. So this I can do in my head, 172 divided by 400, which I cannot do in my head. It's 0 0.43. Okay, those are the empirical probabilities. And now we can compare them to conditional probabilities to see if uh, they're the same or not. You know, has, has this likelihood of voting for an... Um, uh, for a certain issue being affected by voting for the other issue. So how do we compute the probability of D given B? This is a bit trickier, right? So remember, we're only considering the votes for which B, uh, which are in B, okay? So where uh, they voted yes. So now we're only considering these guys. So we're going to divide by this plus that, okay? We're going to divide by the probability of B. What are we going to divide by the probability of D? The, the intersection between D and B, okay? So we're interested in these guys divided by... So it's going to be 151 divided by 151 plus 88, hopefully. Okay, and that's right. And you get 0 0.632. I have already forgotten what the probability of D was, so let's go back. It was 0 0.63, uh, 0 0.43, so it's significantly... It's substantially large, higher if... Um, so if we know that someone has voted yes on budget, then they're, seeing, they're much more likely to have voted yes on uh, these duty-free exports. Okay? And that reveals something about the relationship between uh, these two issues. We can also um, condition on B complement, which is this. And now we're interested in D conditioned on B complement. That's going to be 21 divided by 161. Okay, So it's much, much lower. If we know that someone has voted no on the budget, then uh, where we can be pretty sure that they're going to vote no on duty-free exports. Okay, and again, this relationship is revealed by the empirical conditional probabilities. Okay, so what have we learned in this pretty short video, despite my rambling? Uh, we, have a, we have learned how to estimate probabilities from data. I want to emphasize that uh, the empirical, uh, empirical probabilities are a statistical estimator. So it's like a rule, an algorithm that we have to get some data and compute a probabilistic object. Once you have estimated the probabilistic object, you can manipulate it with your probability rules and so on. But there's that step that goes from data to the probabilistic object. That's what statistics is about. And today we have learned how statistics goes about estimating uh, probabilities. Thank you very much.